Hello, Canucks fans, and welcome back to another episode of the Canucks Conversation, brought to you by the great folks over at Zephyr Epic. You can use promo code Hockey Season, capital H, capital S, all one word, Hockey Season. That'll get you five dollars off your order at Zephyr Epic. Com. We've got a lot of good stuff, courtesy of our friends at Zephyr Epic on the desk here. We've got a Jack Hughes Young Gun over there. We've got the Young Guns checklist from the 2019-20 Upper Deck Series 1 set, I think you call it, um, with Quinn Hughes and Jack Hughes on that on that checklist. And you can't really see it there, but uh, Elias Pedersen rookie commence card with a signed Elias Pedersen draft puck as well. Lots of good stuff courtesy of our friends over at Zephyr Epic. If you want to get in on the fun and you want to go get yourself some hockey cards, and you shop online, you want to visit ZephyrEpic.com. That's Z-E-P-H-Y-R Epic.com. If you want to shop in person, they've got a retail location in Surrey, British Columbia. So be sure to go check them out there. Promo code is Hockey Season. Capital H, capital S, all one word. Hockey Season. $5 off your order and free shipping Canada-wide on any order over $50. All right. My name is Dave Guadrelli. I am joined by Harmon Dial in studio at the iconic Sheraton Wall Center we're going to have a lot of fun today. We're going to be looking under the hood, and people saw the photo, uh, the thumbnail of this video, us looking under the hood of our Fisher Price. 2006 Fisher Price, uh, I don't even know what you call it, is the van. You ha- Did you have that van as a kid? I I did. I didn't. I had this small, um, what do you call it? Uh, call it again, the words escaping my mind, where like one of those construction type. Uh, oh, excavator. Mini- yeah, yeah, like yeah. One of those mini ones yes. that I just like drove around as, oh. as a kid. I had uh, an, an aunt from England who came to visit and just gave it. And I love that thing. That's awesome. So I had a, I had one like the one in the thumbnail, like the Fisher Price car, but it was blue. And that thing had been passed down generations like that thing that thing's old it's gonna need us looking under the hood yeah just uh, five years ago right yeah, we just, just five playing years with ago. these five years ago how do you think i got to the studio today <laughs> <laughs> all right we've got a lot to get to today so we won't waste any more time uh harman you and i have been talking about this a lot off air and it's time to have the conversation on air the canucks nine two and one an absolutely historic start for the Vancouver Canucks. Last time they played this well, you and I were driving Fisher Price cars um, to start their season. 92 and one, like I said, they're on pace for over 60 wins. I did the math on it. I, I tried and I suck at math, but what I came to is if, if they keep up this current pace, they'll go like 62, 14, and six, somewhere around there, somewhere around the 130 point mark. A lot of talk about regression, and rightfully so. The team is probably not going to finish with 130 points on the season, folks. Let's talk about it. PDO, regression, looking under the hood. Let's do it, Harm. Yeah, so it's the big debate in the market right now, especially because the Canucks are becoming one of the biggest stories around the entire NHL that you have all sorts of people weighing in, trying to understand what uh, the Canucks are, especially ones that don't get to see Vancouver as much. You you know, that East Coast media that doesn't stay up. uh, And they're looking at... um, the numbers and PDO is is something that a lot of people are talking about. And I think it'd be great to sort of flesh out that conversation. First of all, start off by even talking about what it is, why it matters, because not everybody is a nerd like me and uh, <laughs> just invested in all these numbers. First of all, PDO, I don't know what it officially stands for. I don't know if it actually officially stands for anything. It might be percentage driven outcomes. That would, that would that, not, yeah, they immediately guesses what it probably is. Like that, that has I haven't to be heard it. an official That's, okay. definition. I'm, I'll look, maybe maybe you look that up. Anyway, it's considered a proxy for luck, right? Uh, PDO is the number you get when you add up a team's five on five shooting percentage offensively with their five on five save percentage defensively. So if your team's shooting 8% at five on five and you're getting um, 920 goaltending, uh, you add that up 92 and 8, your PDO is going to be. Uh, 100. Now, the reason people talk about this is, you know, over a large sample, most teams' PDO typically settles around um, 100. You get some teams that, if they have an elite goalie, they have high end shooting talent, they can finish slightly above 100, right? And some teams that lack those attributes that will finish slightly sort of below that. But last year, for example, 25 of the NHL's 32 teams slotted with a PDO somewhere between 99 and 101.5. So it's a very narrow range. And so the point is, if your PDO is way higher than that sort of 100, 101 range, um, some people call that really lucky. If it's way below that sort of 99 range, a lot of people call that really sort of um, unlucky. 
And people are talking about the Canucks PDO uh, because it's 108.8 through 12 games, which is not only tops in the NHL, but I looked at it going back to 2007 since the stat has been invented. It's the highest uh, through all those years. So that's why it's getting a lot of play. Um, and we wanted to sort of look at the history of, okay, what teams had a really high PDO, got off, got off to a hot start, and what happened to those teams, right? Yeah. When that regression hit, what sort of happened? Did they still make the playoffs? How successful were they? Uh, before I get into the deep dive and, and what I found out about some of the Canucks' historical sort of matches, does that PDO explanation make sense? Did, did I simplify it enough? It does. Uh, PDO also doesn't stand for anything. In business, sometimes it's protected designation of origin, but that's not what it means in <laughs> hockey. And I googled in hockey and it said it doesn't stand for anything. And you, what did you say it was? Uh, percentage driven outcomes. That's got to be it from now on. Let's just, that's what it means. That's Nailed what it means. It. Let's, let's make sure it sticks. And also, Grady just jumped in. I should have mentioned technical producer is Grady Sass. Yesterday, I spent a lot of time looking at my phone, trying to keep an eye on the YouTube live shot. Uh, live chat we've got a new system in place folks grady is going to be keeping an eye on the chat so if you have any questions during this segment we're going to be talking pdo today if you have any questions uh for Harmon or i or you need something explained more let us know in the youtube live chat uh we want to make this as accessible for everybody as possible so if you need further explanations on anything being said just put it in the chat grady's going to let us know um I'm not going to be keeping an eye on the chat during the show, but uh, Grady's going to let us know privately here um, if there's something to be said, if someone has a question, and we will do our best to answer it. So back to the PDO conversation, Harmon. We talked about it being uh, an indicator of luck a lot of times. Are the Canucks really the luckiest team in the NHL right now? They've had a lot of bounces, but this is where you get into the context of yeah, people on the outset. Statistically, they're the luckiest team in the NHL, but it's also a big part of it is their goal differential is, is insane, right? And one thing that I'm sure you're curious about is, okay, what's their PDO and if you remove the blowouts, right? Mm -hmm. They've had four of those, yeah. right? And I wanted to crunch the numbers on that too. If you ignore the four blowouts, that's the two against Edmonton, the San Jose, and the 5 nothing against St. Louis. All of a sudden, it comes down to 103.4, which is, is still high. Uh, most teams don't finish with a 103 or higher PDO, but it's... It's reasonable. Nobody would be talking about it as, oh, this is a massive red flag if it was 103. And if you still remove those four four wins, which the Canucks deserve to win those games anyway, just based off merit, they'd still have a, a five, two, and one record. So that right off the bat is like one of the main reasons. And this is the main takeaway from this conversation for me is that it's an opportunity to explain why there's more than meets the eye with what the numbers say and why, despite this really high PDO, I think there's substance here and why I don't think regression is going to hit the Canucks too hard to the point where, you know, we're worried about them epically collapsing and missing mm -hmm. the playoffs, for example. Like, I'm buying this hot star. I'm not obviously buying them finishing this high in the Western Conference. 130 just, points. They're on pace for it. Like, obviously, I'm not expecting them to fight for a Western Conference crown the entire year, but I am buying them as a playoff team and as legitimately... Um, sort of improved and to go back to you know I wanted to look at the history of what our teams similar to Vancouver situation um, I went back all teams since 2007 that had at least a 104 or higher PDO in their first 11 games and had a really hot start in terms of their points percentage yeah. 12 of those 13 teams ended up making the playoffs Who was 12 the, of 13. what was the one that didn't uh, the 2021 20, in the 56 game yeah. season, uh, Philadelphia Flyers. Oh, and you look at them on paper as well. That Flyers team was not as good, as deep, as talented, especially at the top end of the lineup as the Canucks is one right now. So, right off the bat, that's super interesting. Um, and people have, have even brought up the like the Jay Fresh statistic about expected goals and whatnot. And this is the other part of the conversation, even if you filter for high PDO hot start record wise yeah. and bottom third of the NHL for expected goals, still five teams, four of those five got in. It's a, that same Philly team that didn't make it. And by the way, two of those teams that met all that criteria, yeah. the 2009-10 Washington Capitals, Bruce Boudreau that won the president's <laughs> trophy. <laughs> yes. Uh, and the 16-17 Blackhawks that finished third in the NHL in the entire standing. So it's not just teams that are necessarily squeaking right into the playoffs. 
Uh, you have some legitimately good teams as well. The bad news is, you know, all four of those teams that made the playoffs got eliminated in the first round. But we don't have to worry about that. We can have that conversation about the playoffs when uh, when you get there. Uh, and the other side, side that I wanted to sort of bring up was, you know, expected goals keeps getting brought up. Expected goals. Canucks look bad uh, according to some of those metrics. People are ignoring that if you look at shot attempts at five on five, Canucks are 11th best in the NHL at, uh, at controlling those. They're le- legitimately above average. Uh, and in the early going, it's too early to know what to put more stock into sort yeah. of anyway. And that's part of it that's being sort of ignored, right? Like I saw Dom, I love Dom's work, but... Um, oh, you're about he, to make a lot of Canucks fans very happy. I love Dom's work, but continue. Like he's, <laughs> He was referencing Vancouver's like, oh, they've... Their actual goal differential compared to their expected goal differential. And some of those points are valid, right? The dis- massive disparity, but it's like, okay... What about the other me- other metrics at five on five that are still just as v- valuable from a predictive standpoint that show the Canucks have legitimately been playing well and have legitimately improved since um, last season? And I feel like that sort of flies under the radar. And again, it just goes to my overall point that, yes, the Canucks have had some luck. Thatcher Demko yep. is not going to be like... I can absolutely see him winning the Vezina Trophy. Sure. Yeah, but we're not expecting him to be a 948 save percentage. Absolutely. Fair enough, right? But when you have this type of start, you have the other Pacific Division teams, some of them, especially in Alberta. Scuffling. Scuffling in crisis mode. And you still have at the top of your lineup, Pedersen, Hughes, excellent goaltending in Demko. The above average special teams at uh, at the power play and um, the penalty kill looking legitimately improved. To me, there's enough of a foundation here that you can build from this head start and still be a really good team. This is something we briefly talked about on yesterday's show was that the cushion that the team has laid out for themselves now, it would take an epic collapse for things to fall and for them not to make the playoffs. And that's what I brought up yesterday when we were talking about regression very briefly was I was saying, okay, well, right now, the power play, the 5-5 and play, the penalty kill, and the goaltending is all going very well. For this team and Rutherford's famously said if everything goes right we have a playoff team right now we have a playoff team on our hands in Vancouver I think it's safe to say that now because everything's gone right for so long it's already been 12 games and look it's only an 82 game season folks because things have gone right already and things have also gone wrong for the teams below them like you've pointed out it's hard to imagine that all of the power play the penalty kill the five and five play and the goaltending will fall at the same time I also think the goaltending is the most sustainable thing about this team. And it's the thing we need to, you know, kind of keep our hopes up for the most. I would say like there's going to be ebbs and flows, the power play, the five and five play and the penalty kill. And yes, Thatcher Demko is not going to keep a 948 all season long, but it is the most sustainable part of this team. So when we have this conversation about PDO, Harmon, I know you have a few more points I'll let you get to, but when we have this conversation about PDO, the thing I look at in terms of regression is Yes, the Canucks will regress from being a team on pace to put up 130 points in the standings. Yes, the Canucks will regress from a team that had a 9-2-1 start. Yes, all of those things are going to happen. Their PDO is very high while they are playing like that team that's going to go for 130 points in the standings, right? But another team whose PDO is very high is the Las Vegas Golden Knights, right? Like, they also have a very high PDO. Obviously not as high as the Canucks, and I think we buy a little bit more into the defending cup champions' chances at being... uh, top of the Pacific team but nonetheless the Canucks are going to come down from this but when they come down I'm not convinced that it's going to be at a level where they all of a sudden start playing like a team ranked 15 to 20th in the NHL like I still think this team can be a top 15 team easily for the rest of the way absolutely so just as a reference point Don Lushishin's model at the athletic had the Canucks is roughly a, a coin flip to make the playoffs before the season which Sounded fair, sounded about right. Now they're at 90% odds yep. because of, again, the hot start, the rest of uh, the Pacific Division. So that just goes to show you, I mean, and it tracks with the history of the teams that uh, that I mentioned that had a hot start and you were talking about, okay, they've got a really high PDO. Can this be sustainable? Well, it was good enough at least for them to at least qualify for the postseason. And, and what's also interesting is when you look at that group of five teams that I'd brought up that um, 
had that hot start, really inflated PDO, and were sort of bottom third in the NHL at controlling five and five expected goals. The the sort of, you know, four of those five made the playoffs. Two of them were, in, when you look at the 1920 Predators, they just kind of snuck in. Same thing with the 2009-10 abs. And then, of course, I'd mentioned the President's Trophy winning Capitals and the 16-17 Blackhawks that finished third in the, third in the NHL. What's interesting is when you looked at look at those Washington Washington and Chicago teams that really sort of took off and finished that high in the standings, and what I referenced about the Canucks being sort of eleventh in the NHL for controlling shot shot volume, it, it was the same thing for Chicago and um, and Washington, where expected goal models hated them, but for shot volume at least at five on five, they were like just outside the top ten, similar to how the Canucks are right now, and. When you look at sort of Philly being the one team in 2021 that you missed the playoffs, um, having that same profile, their shot volume, they ranked dead last in the NHL, I think, or 30th, maybe second last. So it just goes to show you that if anything, the Canucks are sort of, at least statistically, their, their profile doesn't match like the one team there that missed the playoffs. Mm-hmm. It matches closer to the upper echelon that went on to you know be really successful. And again, I'm not saying the Canucks are... You know, like I'd be shocked if the Canucks finished top five in the overall league standings. Sure. I'm not saying they've got that type of ceiling, uh, but this doesn't have to be a team either that is just squeaking into the playoffs. Uh, there's there's a lot to like here, and I I think there's legit substance. Even just watching the team play, like honestly, if I feel like people who are outside this market, and I saw. Charlie O'Connor, who used to be a colleague at the Athletic, um, really smart guy. But really? man, first are, you, of all, are you sure about that? <laughs> well, he's getting flamed by Canucks Twitter, uh, talking about the PDO and how he expects them to regress hard. Number one, I just wanted to say this is one of those rare moments where things are going well. Canucks fan, Canucks Twitter is united. Yes. It's really united. Usually yes. it's split, and and we're like fighting amongst each other. <laughs> this time, everybody's riding high and it's just ready to like pick pick on other people. So this is a message for anybody outside of Vancouver. Now, now is not the time to poke the bear. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I see legit substance here. Just, you know, again, to sort of allude to people outside of Vancouver, if they just sort of watch the team play, especially with the history compared to uh, last season. Again, I've referenced how much calmer and steadier they look holding yeah. leads. The, the adversity when, when there's a momentum shift and the other team scores – instead of getting nervous and instead of compounding that uh, change in momentum by shooting themselves in the foot, they're actually striking back and, and showing some backbone, which I'm not just referencing last season, but even the year before, I was on uh, one of the road trips, 2021-22, at the start of the year where Travis Green was still coaching and the Canucks just fell apart in that road trip. I remember uh, I remember Colorado scoring one goal and for the rest of the game, it's just like the tires deflated from the yes. team. It's just like it's just like those intangibles that you sense something's different, uh, as well with um, just how bought in the core seems to be with playing this team first mentality. Nobody's cheating for offense, which honestly we've seen in years past. Guys yep. cheating for offense, not as much commitment to defensive play. I mean, it, it's been like you know Brock Besser in that Dallas game, for example. I'm seeing this guy on puck recoveries, rate like skating as fast as he can and trying to throw a big hit on SL Lindell. And, yep. you know, not that that hit turned out particularly well because Lindell is built like a like a, a, a pole, just so big and strong. But you see moments like that. You see moments like him making in the third period an intense, you know, defensive check in the third period to take away a, a slot, slot shot. And it's just like, this is the type of buy-in that I don't think they had from the core in, in years past. And I think that those things make a difference too. Yeah, the eye test definitely backs up the saying that, yes, this team is playing very, very well right now, and there are going to be some things that take a step back, but they are playing well enough that you don't think that all of those things are going to fall off at once, right? I think, and, and we'll close out this segment on this, knock on wood, of course, but I think what this team really needs to prepare for, and you know, as much as we're talking about regression, what could really affect this team is an injury to a key player because I still, they've improved their depth. Don't get me wrong, but I still don't love their depth in terms of who are the guys who are replacing your stars. Right. And I know this is basically true of every team, but like 
knock on wood, of course, but if, if a guy like Quinn Hughes or hell, even Philip Ronick goes down, this team is in trouble. If Mark Friedman goes down, this team might be in trouble. Like that's where we're at right now. And I, yeah. again, in trouble is definitely a um, exaggeration, but I think the guy replacing Mark Friedman makes you a worse team. Yeah. I think it's safe to say that. And look, that, that's going to happen. I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer. I just think that I'm not so worried about this team regressing and you know falling off of the playoff bar or anything like that. I start to worry about it if there's an injury. And I yeah. mean, of course, we'll get there when we get there. Injuries are going to happen. But that's why it's so important to have the depth that the Canucks are trying so hard to build, right? Like, Teddy Bluger's not even back yet, right? Like, Teddy Bluger makes this a better team. And you've got the Asia leading point getter in Archdeep Baines down in the minors right now. He's going to be able to come in, maybe make an impact this season on a fourth or third line in a bottom six role. Maybe next season he's able to actually make that jump. But they're developing their guys to be able to go play in Vancouver. And that's something they focus on a lot at training camp. It was a lot of the messaging was that Colleton and Tockett are really on the same page. And just as an organization, obviously we know there's a lot of, um, I don't know what the word, you know, like it, it's fluid. Everybody is on the same page, pulling on the same rope, but especially when it comes to the coaching staff and we, we've talked to some for players about this on the show, we'll get some more on the show t- soon too. But they all say like, when you go up to Vancouver, you know what's going to happen because they are playing a very similar system and style of play down in Abbotsford as they are in Vancouver. So that when guys come up, they're not lost. They're not trying to learn a bunch on the fly. They know what's expected of them because they have that communication from the NHL to the AHL level. And I just think that's so important. And that's why when the team's healthy, it's huge to just bank as many early, early points as you can get, because especially in this league where, even losses are rewarded with points if you can push it to overtime or shoot out. It's just so hard to make up ground. I mean, you think about the type of hole when Bruce Boudreaux took over, the Canucks were in, and how hot they were the rest of the way. It felt like the Canucks were perpetually somewhere between like three to seven points out of the playoff race. And people would sort of have this optimism about, oh, they're only four points out. Yeah, But when you have that many sort of competitors and the teams above you, they're still, even when they're struggling, they're able to like squeak out an overtime point here, shoot out point there. And obviously they're still going to win games Mm -hmm. here and there. It's just so hard to pull ahead once you're, once you're behind. And and that's why that this early cushion is is so massive for this team. And I think that's what the Alberta teams are about to find out is once, you know, because look, we see the oily boys. They're still very positive out there. Our colleagues are your colleagues now too out in Edmonton. They're like, oh, it's just, they're just unlucky. It's just a bad start. It's hard to dig yourself out of that. Uh, It's very hard to dig yourself out of that. It's much harder to dig yourself out of the bottom of the standings once you're eliminated from the Wendy's daily face-off survivor game. Wendy's is offering fresh prizes all season long with that game at Wendy's Daily Faceoff Survivor. The game lives weekly on dailyfaceoff.com with weekly prizes and a season-long prize of $5,000 up for grabs. It's simple. You sign up, play, and you get free stuff on the Wendy's app. You pick a prop that will happen in a game every day of the week, and the longer you survive with correct answers, the more you can win from Wendy's. So while you obsess over your dream team, reward that de- dedication with Wendy's new obsession, the very real barbecue bacon cheeseburger freshly added to the Wendy's lineup. Enjoy the Applewood smoked bacon and crispy onions as cheese melts over the fresh, never-frozen Canadian beef. Uh, not going to talk about my results. I forgot to make a pick yesterday, so I'm eliminated. <laughs> from the game uh, this week. But a guy, I wonder if he's eliminated. Joining us now, the daddy over at DFO. The DFO daddy. Do you go by that, Frank? Uh, Frank Cervelli joins us. No, I don't. You want to? No, I don't. <laughs> and <clears throat> I was uh, I was eliminated on Tuesday night. I had Travis Konechny scoring a goal. He's been off to a hot start. And against the Sharks, I was like, they give up 10. Come on, Travis Konechny, he can get a goal. That didn't happen. Uh, do the Sharks beat the Edmonton Oilers tomorrow? I don't think they do. But here, here's what I want to do to begin our session today. I would like you guys to roll your head back and go to the left and go to the right and then give it a little shake. Because I listened to both of you talk <laughs> before I joined. And I'd like to drive to Vancouver or fly there, however I can get there quickest, and slap both of you. Because listen to the conversation you guys were just having. How ridiculous it sounds of where the Canucks are at right now compared to the conversations that we might have been having over any point over the last few seasons. 
Did you did I just hear you say correctly that the the Canucks might be in trouble if Mark Friedman goes down? <laughs> Come on. Get it together, give yourselves a head shake and and let's move on. This team this team is not regressing. The Vancouver Canucks aren't regressing. That's not happening. Frank, they're not going to they're not going to be a 130 point team. So yes, they are going to regress from their current pace. That's our point. They're not going to regress too much, but they they're not going to finish with 130 points. No, they're not, but I, I is it is it a regression to say that they're going to be a 100 point team this year? I mean, no, that's fair. Isn't it technically? Technically no, it is. No, it's not and not really <laughs> like cuz that's that's not really what we're talking about. Like You're right. Well, this is a progression from an 80 point absolutely team, 80 plus point team <laughs> to where they're going this year and here's the thing um i heard you guys talking about position and in in ma- in the standings and the math required i actually did some of this number crunching today before joining you and it wasn't because i knew we would be talking about this but i was just curious for the canucks to get in this is where it begins to get really fun. Because of their 9-2 and 1 start, they only need 79 points over the last 70 games. Yes, to be a guaranteed Stanley Cup playoff team. And so what you're talking about is 564 hockey, and people say, "Okay, well that's still something." Like, "No, no, no. In today's NHL, like most teams are playing at 625 or more." And they've afforded themselves this luxury now of not sitting back, but you're not going to have your A game every night. And so what they can do is, uh, is just a little milk, milk, squirt, squirt, just bank some points, milk away some points here and there. One point shootout loss, one point overtime loss, whatever it might be, start stockpiling points they've done that already but as the season begins to get long in the tooth that is the luxury that a nine two and one start has afforded them absolutely one of the huge bounce back performances driving the canucks's hot start here is is brock besser Uh, he's been phenomenal scoring tons of goals in all situations and it's funny because you go you go back to last season and it felt like his name was all over the rumor mill. Uh, it seemed like the Canucks were really motivated to get off the contract. It, it's it's just funny to think what what you know an alternate timeline where Besser's doing this on another team and 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 how much that would have stung. Just kind of curious from your perspective, how close do you think the Canucks ultimately were last season to pulling uh, uh, pulling the trigger on a Besser, Besser trade because? people say the best moves are sometimes the the ones you don't make. I think in this case, it was one that they couldn't make. I think in a perfect reality, the Canucks were so intent and set on trying to find a suitor for him that the contract was getting in the way of them doing something. And he probably would have moved on had had his contract been a one-year deal or whatever it might have been. That's the real truth in the matter. I think what really changed in a big way was Brock Besser's attitude. And remember how all how surprised we all were when it was locker clean out day and he's like, I don't want to be traded. Mm-hmm. I want to be here. I actually like it here. And he, it was a really refreshing, confidence-inspiring moment, I think, not just for Besser, but for the rest of the group. It was like, hey, this guy's name has been dragged through the mill. and Yet he's like, yeah, I like it here. I'm in his ability and willingness to stick with it through a lot of really tough situations. And not just that, but the off ice stuff that he's dealt with, I think is incredibly impressive and a testament to his character because think about it from just a pure on ice perspective, like park the trade rumors park, um, you know, the really awful stuff that, you know, went on off the ice for him with his family. And then just look at his game and you're like, wait a second, this guy came into the league as a goal scorer and now all of a sudden can't score. What happened? And to find that touch again, it's hard to do. And he's battled through it and, and made it out to the other side. 
That's an excellent point. And obviously there was the back injury in his rookie year, which does affect your shooting, but he's had injuries along the way as well. So that's a really good point that he had that off season to, you know, kind of prepare himself. And we know he changed up his training this off season under the advice of Rick Tockett. So Frank, really good points in a similar note. We've heard Connor Garland. We've heard Anthony Beauvillier a little bit lately. Do you get the sense that we're still going to see a trade from the Canucks here? I think they'd like to try. I think they are also so happy with their start that I think they're probably like, we can wait until the right thing comes along down the pike. And like, look, is their cap structure, you know, even with a nine, two and one start um, perfect or the way that they'd like it to be? I think the answer is an obvious no. I, you know, when you've got guys, making what Beauvillier is and what he's being asked, the role he's being asked to play in. It's a clear imbalance. Um, I, I think when you look at Garland, I, I think there's, you know, from his perspective, I'm sure there's, you know, an openness to it. I think from the Canucks perspective, if they could find a way to make it happen for sure. Um, but Beauvillier is by far, I think, um, maybe the easiest guy to move from this group um, hmm. given that imbalance because of the idea that he's in the final year of his deal. Like, you know, I, I doubt they're going to be willing to retain because that defeats the purpose. But if there's someone out there that feels like they might be able to flip rehab Beauvillier into something else uh, because of the spot that he's been sort of mired in, in Vancouver, um, I think maybe that's where there might be an opening. But again, not to say they're content. They're always looking. I think they're hungry to do something to you know, further improve this team and improve that cap flexibility and situation. But he sort of stands out also as the guy that they kind of like the least. Frank, where do you think Rick Tockett has had the biggest impact for this team's turnaround? Harm, I would say structure. One, and I would say two, mentality, approach, and compete. Um, I think some of those things go hand in hand. When you compete, obviously your structure looks better. But also, like, the hard part to figure out, and, and we've given Rick Tockett tons of credit, and I would never take away from that uh, because I think he's a huge part of this turnaround. But the other part of this that goes part and parcel to um, the Canucks success this season has just been personnel too. changing out that defense core and taking away fringe NHL players from your three to seven, you know, spots in your lineup defensively, that's going to make a huge difference. Um, but I think the biggest thing that stood out from the Boudreaux era was, uh, structure habits, practices, uh, defensive zone, you know, play and compete. And then also like little thing that I think has stood out in a big way has been body language. I'm a big mm. believer in that. And if you watch that clip over and over again of Jonathan Huberto on the bench last night in Calgary, like it was almost kind of a lesson in what not to do. If you're ever in a spot where you're benched, it just looks so low and uh, lacking confidence that that's kind of one thing like posture, body language, like this Canucks team has had some juice this season and yeah, results are a big part of that. But like how you think about the season, what you're being told, what your coaching staff communicates and thinks of you, like all those things, um, they all matter. Posture, body language, and juice. That's the Canucks next uh, season ticket video. <laughs> Instead of, they had a season ticket. I don't know if you knew this. Trying to sell season tickets. They called it structure, accountability, habits. Those were the three things that they uh, highlighted. And there was even a clip. I think it was Miller saying wins and losses don't even matter right now. And everybody flamed them in the offseason for that. But hey, their structure, accountability, and habits have been uh, very good. To start Watch, the year. You it's all about the little things. Like here's a little thing I would work on with you. Get yourself a damn cough button. And let's go from there. It's all, oh, I don't even want to get into it. I'm not getting into it, Frank. It's it's over. It's out of my reach. It's out of my reach. That's all I'll say. I can't read. Anyways, anyways, uh, you brought it up. Jonathan Huberto last night gets benched. The only thing that Canucks fans like more than seeing their team succeed is the Alberta team sputtering out of the gate. And I think it's safe to say that's happened for both teams. The Calgary Flames last night, Jonathan Huberto on the bench. 
off to a terrible start in Calgary there. Like, what do you make of that whole situation? It's a tough one. I mean, really, like, I think the biggest thing I'm left with is where do the Flames go from here? And where does Huberto go from here? Because you've got to work on solutions. Like, on a one-time, one-off basis, like, all for Ryan Huska, you know, making this decision to bench Huberto. Your team is trying to find a way to get going. They f- they're having a game where they feel good about themselves. They're starting to string together some results. Kadri's got a four-game point streak. Like, there's a lot of things coming together for, for the Flames. And then you've got this one guy that's sort of just not connecting. And I don't know why that is. I don't think anyone can put their finger on it. I don't think it's physical. I do think there's a big mental component to it. I think there's some pressure of trying to live up to that contract. And you've got all this coming together, and that's great. But now what? One time, sure. But you can't healthy scratch him. You can't. This is the first year of an $84 million contract. Obviously, there's no viable you know, out outcome where he could find himself playing somewhere else and get a fresh start. You've got to work through this. You got to bring a shovel to work. And that, that goes for both sides. When I mean, there's not adversarial, but Huberto and the flames, he's got to, he's got to be better. He's got to put in the work to uh, get back to being a productive player but the flames have to also give him some opportunity to get there. Not to say that they haven't to this point, but he's in the one fifties or one sixties in terms of even strength ice time this season. You know, I'm not saying that he hasn't gotten it and you could make the argument that he has to earn more, but for the meantime, you have to work together to get to where you want to get to. Speaking of the, of the other Alberta team, you could tell the Canucks really wanted to twist the knife in on Monday because last minute to go, already up 5-5-2, five, five, Canucks ice, ice their first power play unit, and they're scoring a pretty tic-tac-toe uh, goal around. And even some of the hits that the Canucks were sort of making in third period, you could tell that there was something extra there. In Edmonton, sort of what's... First what off, wait, I want to stop you because I love that. Yeah. I freaking love it. It's the best. It's awesome. It's awesome. It was because it, it was, it was oh, the Oilers were taking cheap shots at the Canucks players. That's what was happening. It was Darnell Nurse, time to shine, where it was garbage time, so he's doing something stupid, and they countered with that. But it's a mentality. It goes back to what yeah. I was saying to you. That's Rick Tockett in a nutshell. He's all class, but if you get in his way, if you step the wrong way, he'll pound you. And... It's the same message over and over again. We're playing for keeps. We're the Canucks. We've arrived. We're here. I don't care that you're the Stanley Cup contender or favorite or trendy pick or that you've got cup or bust expectations. We've leveled you three times this season already, and we're not going anywhere in the Pacific. It's a message sent. Absolutely. And what I wanted to follow up there was what are the options on the table in terms of what happens next whether it's coaching change or you know a big trade which might be difficult because they don't have a lot of cap space Um, especially because and I'm curious to get your take you know in in all of this as well Leon Drysettle's future sort of looms large as well because you know this coming summer he's going to be a year away and you're going to want to make sure that you're able to convince him to stay big picture where do you think the Oilers are at well big picture I don't think the Drysettle thing comes into effect at all you know anywhere in the short term that's parked way off in the distance. I've never really had any doubt about what that will unfold. Like, because look, dry and McDavid are attached at the hip. There's a reason why he bought a house in Ontario. They, you see social media harm. They spent all summer together. They're not, they're the only place on planet earth cap wise that they can play together is exactly where they are right now. So I'm not concerned about that. I don't think the Oilers are either. But in the short term, you asked what's on the table. My answer is everything. They made the first move on their emergency checklist, and that was the easiest move, which is send Jack Campbell through waivers, bring up Cal Pickard, see if Campbell can find his game again, and see if somehow the league's worst goaltending can give you a stop, whether it's Skinner, Pickard, the second coming of Jesus, whoever it might be. (laughs) and 
that's a huge thing. Um, because it also sends a lightning bolt right up the ass of the rest of the roster. And you know why? It's because they really like Jack Campbell. He's a really popular teammate. And so that's an important sort of first step. And then the next thing is, if this doesn't work, you give it another two or three games and, and see what this team looks like at the end of this road swing. And then you've got the coach card to play. I think that's on the table. And if that doesn't work, then you've got a seismic trade opportunity at some point that's foundational franchise shaking. I don't think in this season at any point, unless you're kind of mathematically eliminated that with the players and horses you have, you leave any stone unturned. That's just my own personal opinion. Uh, this is the biggest season I think in Oilers franchise history since 1990. It's that big of a deal in terms of expectations and where this team had progressed to and where they're at. Um, will it get to that point? I don't know. Ask me in a week's time because I think we're going to have a better idea as daunting as the math already kind of becomes. And you guys sort of hinted at that and the pressure that the Oilers are facing. I mean, the real truth of it is they've got some runway to dig themselves out of it because we do, at least I do, see this team as one that could reel off 10 straight wins and no one would really blink. You just got McDavid and Dreisaitl bludgeoning the rest of the league. I mean, we've seen it before, and they closed out last year 14-0-1. They kind of just really mathematically need to get to 500 by the midpoint. But these next eight games, seven games to get to the quarter mark, could go a really long way in lessening that burden. And that's why you're starting to see things turn now, because I think they've reached a point where they know we can't just sit idle here and hope and pray that this thing's going to turn around. We've got to start doing stuff. I'd be interested to see how long Ken Holland just gets a free pass from ownership on all this. I, I, I wonder. I don't think there's any real connection there um, in the sense that this is Ken Holland's last year, like sending him off on a, you know, on a six month vacation to close out his contract. I don't, it's not going to send shockwaves. Um, and not to say that he's absolved of blame, but there's yeah. a new hierarchy in place with Jeff Jackson as their CEO of hockey ops, that it's a joint decision at this point already right. of yeah. what happens next, that it's not all just Ken Holland making the decisions. He's got a boss now that's intimately involved in making those calls. Frank, great stuff as always, my friend. Thank you for joining us. See you guys, and just just tone down the regression talk. It's it. There, there's going to be saying positive things. <laughs> slight stuff. Just just keep it keep it going. Keep your heads on straight. Awesome. Thanks, Frank. See you guys. That was no. I'm not going to call him Daddy DFO again. <laughs> he didn't like that. I, I, I did Daddy not see DFO. That I didn't. Like I, didn't that. I can see why. <laughs> like, it's a good name. It's not. It's a good name. Okay. Uh, we we'll quickly get this in the four wins prospect roundup brought to you by our friends over at four winds brewing family owned and operated in delta home of the four winds light light lager a crisp clean and easy drinking beer a beer for everyone a perfect beer for before after or during the game ask for four winds light lager at your local liquor store or have some delivered right to your door through the online shop at four winds brewing.ca we'll have to check if they ship to alberta uh okay our prospect roundup, a lot of it coming courtesy of my pal Dave Hall, who's do, crushing our prospect coverage over at Canucks Army, but this is important stuff. Jonathan LeCaramacchi and Elias Peterson will suit up for Sweden at the Five Nations Tournament. Uh, it's already started. It kicked off today in Czechia, and it's going to run all weekend long. We will have coverage of it uh, over at CanucksArmy.com. Like I said, LeCaramacchi and Peterson obviously both for Sweden. Those are the Canucks' only representation at this tournament. We'll have tons of coverage over it, like I said, at CanucksArmy.com. Moving to the AHL, Vasily Podkolzin. This was really good to see after he went down with that concussion, that really scary incident uh, where he had the seizure on the ice, the convulsions, whatever you want to call it. It was a very scary situation that Podkolzin found himself in. Obviously, he was good the next day, like 
we were talking to Ryan Johnson and he said that uh, Buck Colson said he was fine. He's good. He's good to go. And he was walking around um, really good to see that he avoided a major injury. He is back on the ice. So his next step in his recovery and his return to play has begun. He was back on the ice at Abbotsford practice today, courtesy of our pal, Ben Lipka. Any other prospect stuff you want to get? That's all I got. Not yet. I am waiting to do towards the middle second half of the month. I'm going to do a bit more video work and probably talking to Ryan Johnson a little bit more. So we'll, we'll go heavier on the prospect stuff then. Sweet. Awesome. Okay. Uh, let's get to it. Anyone else get your, anyone else's in folks. I should have mentioned it before. I'm going to go over this again. We're all going to have our chats open. It's not just going to be me looking at my phone and we'll get to your questions. Anything you want to get in uh, as we close out the show here, anything else you want us to talk about any questions you have, it could be about anything. It's called anyone else. And it is presented by DoorDash. It's our listeners' chance to get involved and hit us up in the YouTube live chat. And it's also our listeners' chance to get 25% off and their delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more. For a limited time, our listeners can get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter code NATION25. That's NATION25, all capital letters. Offer valid in Canada, subject to change. Terms, of course, do apply. Okay. What do we got here? Uh, people are really liking the, uh, someone's a dad. <laughs> Commander, Commander Vander in the YouTube live chat said daddy face off instead of daily face off. Uh, daddy face off, Frank Saravalli. I joined the it's show. It's going to stick. It's going to stick. Day three and we already have nonsense. <laughs> there are no words. <laughs> okay, Jeremy Lee, this one's for you. Oh, we'll, we'll all answer it. Grady, you can answer it too, but we'll go Harmon, me, and then Grady answer it. Your favorite goal song? Around the NHL? Let's say your favorite choice for goal song. And sure, around the NHL. Give I don't think answers. I have just like one right off the bat in terms of like what would be a great song that isn't already being used. I'll say some of my favorite goal songs are Rangers one. I think goal songs that are really easy to cheer along with that the whole building gets behind. I think the Rangers one. I don't know what the song names are, but Rangers one is great. Whoa! I think. Hey! <laughs> exactly. Hey! hey! You nailed it. And uh, the Sens one is really good, too. Yeah, the Sens have a good one. Um, I'm The Vancouver Canucks current goal song is really growing on me. All this talk of changing the goal song, I'm hearing everybody's suggestions. I'm sorry, they're garbage. Like, the goal song they have right now is absolutely fine. It's a good goal song, dare I say it. Now, if you're going to change it, you got to change it to something that the crowd's going to sing along to. Uh, Seven Nation Army. The other night we were at the game. I think Cody Severson pointed this out on Twitter. Also, ah. shout out to Cody. He made our thumbnail for this episode of us fixing the Fisher Price car. But Seven Nation Army, unprompted, everybody started just singing along with that in the arena. Unprompted. And it was it was it was a beautiful thing. And I'd be really interested to see if they made that the goal song, how much people would buy into that. I like their current one, but if you're gonna change it. Go with something that's going to work. Go with something that people are going to sing along with. Behind the scenes, it's been a while that they've been on and off. The organization has been in terms of debating whether to keep this one or, or go with a new one. So I am curious to see. Now that they've gone off to an electric start, maybe they just keep it. But there was definitely some of that chatter behind the scenes. Not only, I think, heading into this year, but even before uh, uh, last season as well. Grady, your thoughts. Goal song. Don't say Chelsea Daker. Don't say Chelsea Daker. <laughs> Don't say Chelsea Daker. Uh, I liked Holiday. It yes, just yeah. reminded me of good times. Um, yeah, I didn't. I don't really know. Like, usually when they score, I'm just I'm happy to hear or to to see that they scored and the fan reaction. Uh, something around the league. Oh, I used to. <laughs> I'm gonna get ratioed in the comments. I used to like the Leafs uh, Hall and Oats. Oh yeah, my gosh! I know. I know. Oh hey, my gosh! It worked. I lived for Toronto. I lived in Toronto for six years. Maybe that's uh, some of the Eastern bias getting to me. But uh, yeah, I'll go with Holiday. Bring it back. Okay, Rohan K asks: It's early, but thoughts on Tockett for Adams and Hughes for Norris? Question mark and PD's potential for Selkie. What do for you think? For Selkie, was? I think that's really interesting because everybody's looking at the heart right now. Heart Art Ross. People are looking at that for Elias Pedersen. But we will talk more about Quinn Hughes and the Norris later in our Betway bet. I'm sure you saw the article. Well, I'm not sure. But if you did see the article at Canucks Army that I wrote just before the show went live here, Quinn Hughes is now the front runner for the Norris Trophy. And he opened the season with plus 900 odds. And now he's at plus 200. That's 50 
better than Kael McCarr, who sits at 250. And then the drop-off between them, and I think Rasmus Dahlin is third right now on the odds over there. It's a big drop-off. So it's basically just tier 1A for your boy Dom. Let him know. <laughs> Kael McCarr, Quinn Hughes, everybody else below. That's what it is right now. I'll tell Dom. Yeah, you should. Uh, and, and as for Patterson for the Selkie, yeah, I like... I, I want to try to pull up my ballot from last year because I definitely had... Actually, I don't know if I had him on the Selkie. No, I did. I had him on the Selkie. Um, I think I had him fifth. Yeah, you did. I remember yeah. looking at that. Yeah, I think, I, did have I, him think I had him fifth on my ballot. Did you put him on yours? Because you actually vote for the award. I didn't. Okay, you didn't have him on? The only He was really close, but for me, the reason I didn't, and I think part of the reason why... You were hanging out with Dom, that's why. Yeah, that, that's a big part of it. Too much Eastern media uh, influence. Uh but like JT Miller takes the tough matchups, right? Like even oh, now, like he's been the one that's been going up against McDavid and shutting him down. Um, Zabinijad, uh, Rope Hints, like he's Miller's in a much tougher defensive mm. spot in terms of the minutes that he's playing. And for Pedersen, it's not so much ability because I, I think he's absolutely one of the best best two way centers in the league, but he's not deployed in You're some right. of those really tough minutes that other elite centers are, and I think that hurts his selkie case a little bit you gonna put uh miller on your ballot i mean look if if he keeps this up <laughs> <laughs> but i it's love crazy, it crazy isn't it right like the 180 from last year yes from i don't think i've seen from one year to the next this type of 180 from a skater in terms of their defensive performance from going to people like not just in vancouver but yeah. around the nhl people mm-hmm. talking about and rightfully so, the turnovers, the terrible back checks, and oh, what a lazy defensive player to what he's been doing right now, where he's been night after night, one of this team, one of this team's best defensive performers. Again, three games against McDavid, head to head. McDavid lined in score a single five on five goal. Just unbelievable. Yeah, absolutely. And it it's been all season long. And I, hey, like, you know, we give all the love to Miller there. I was talking on Scarson Price this morning about Brock Besser, Phil DiGiuseppe, those guys have really stepped up in that defensive role as well. Yeah. And we talked about them hounding on the forecheck, especially those two guys, you know, how quickly they get in. Unbelievable that what we're seeing from that line so far. And yes, talk it for Jack Adams. I think, uh, who votes on that? Is it the broadcasters or the GMs? No, it's okay. Broadcasters go on the Jack Adams and then GMs go on the Vesna. I was getting it mixed up. But yes, I, I think I think the broadcasters yeah. will give some love to Rick Tockett because that's the thing. If you look at, what has gone right for this team the most? I think it is the coaching. Like if the Canucks finish in the first, second or third spot in the Pacific second or third, let's say, especially first, but if they finish in a Pacific Pacific division spot to make the playoffs. Yeah. Rick talk. It's absolutely going to pick up votes. I don't know if he'll win the award. I think he probably should, but I'm also biased, but um, I don't know. I, I think he has a real shot at it. If they keep this up, if, even if they just make the playoffs, I think that's enough of a 180 from where we've seen this team in recent years that, Hockett should get some love on the talk on the Jack Adams voting. Yeah, I I agree. If I mean, if it ended today, Jack Adams tends to be a, a, a sort of an award that's almost like biggest surprise team or, or biggest turnaround because look at the goalie. history. Yeah, that too. I mean, but you look at the history of the coaches that win the award. It's not like if it were, let's say, a John Cooper in Tampa or a Rod Brindamore in Carolina. If you've been in a market on an established, really good team for a long time, you just don't get Jack Adams love. It's usually for mm-hmm. like a surprise team, a relatively new head coach. And uh, so far, Taka checks um, all of those boxes. Antagonist with a good point here. He said, I believe we will have two to three award finalists. I think that's very possible. Hope so. Maybe four. Maybe four. If Harmon gets, uh, rallies the troops and gets JT Miller in the top three for <laughs> Selkie voting. Uh, okay, let's move on from anyone else a uh, lot of good stuff folks i wish we could get to it all uh the one i want to get to we'll close it out on this oz nuck said why does besser shrug his shoulders after every shot is it a habit issue or the shoulder pads i know you don't know do you know the answer no, no. i want to ask him about that remind me next time we're in the locker room with him just remind me that we he does he, he you haven't noticed it he like shoots and then it's like a he almost like he does a little thing oh with his nose okay okay too. i know he what like, you mean i know yeah, what you yeah. mean yeah i just did it on camera for those on the podcast <laughs> but uh yeah we'll, we'll try to get the answer from brock there next time we uh next time we see him okay uh anything else from you Harmon, or do you want to get to betway now close it out go to betway okay get to our betway 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 bet of the day pull it up there grady uh quinn hughes not necessarily a bet you should go make right now 
because we've been highlighting the ones that have the crazy odds, like Elias Patterson for the heart, Thatcher Demko for the Vesna. The odds makers were ahead of this one. They've got Quinn Hughes as the favorite to win the Norris Trophy this year at plus 200 odds, the best odds of any defenseman in the National Hockey League. A $10 bet gets you $30. If you choose to play, please play responsibly. Must be 19 plus. The reason I wanted to bring this up is I just wanted to close out the show today talking about how we've seen Hughes just absolutely skyrocket to that upper echelon of defensemen in the NHL. He's just been, like, he, he's been... Miller called him a cheat code this morning on Halford and Ruff. And it's hard to disagree. Like, with the way he's able to wheel the puck out of his zone, able to make passes out of his zone, um, no matter what kind of pressure he's facing, the way he's able to avoid real contact, it's just so impressive. Like, I was trying to think of the last time we saw a defenseman play at this level and with this level of confidence, playing those matchup minutes, you're killing penalties, you're doing it all. And, like, I was trying to think of it, and the the... the Biggest comparable I came to was like Roman Yossi in his absolute prime. Like Roman Yossi's best year in Nashville was the last time I think I saw a defenseman this good and controlling play this well. I'm sure McCarr has had moments and yeah. stretches like this too. But with Hughes, the interesting thing is he's leveled up this year, but I'd argue he deserved Norris votes last year. And I, and I believe I had him on my ballot and, and I did a big deep dive. I, I think- had him second on my ballot, I think. Yeah, I didn't have quite have him second, but <laughs> I, I definitely towards the end of the season, I remember writing an article making the case for Hughes. I, th- I think so much of it is perception, right? So much of it is the team narrative because last year nobody focuses on Hughes or, or Pedersen's performances because the team is such a, um, a disaster that all the storylines are on trades yep. and, and Horvat and oh, what are they going to do with Miller? All of these, um, you know, Rick Tockett coming in, there's just this endless drama and the team's terrible. So the the individual star performances don't get credit. And I think a huge part of Hughes getting more love, getting more national spotlight is the Canucks. It's like people look at the Canucks in the standings and go, like, what's going on? Especially those that don't follow too closely. And then, and then you're more inclined to look at, okay, why are they off to this type of start? And then you open up, the NHL.com leaderboard, and it's like a Canuck yeah. leading in every category. So it's just the Canucks team stats. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, anything else you want to get to? Uh, Grady said there was a question here. When is the sample size not so small? After 20 games, this is a question from Andrew. So we're backtracking a little bit to anybody else. When is the sample size not so small? I mean, it depends for like, like for what, right? Because if you're looking at for whether this is a team good enough to make the playoffs, I already sort of believe it, right? On that, in terms of really knowing what a team is and really having confidence and understanding maybe the team's baseline, you know, talent level, I'd look at 25 to 30 games, but that's standard. I don't mean that from a perspective of, oh, I need to see this type of hot start, you know, for another, um, you know, another 10 to 15 games, 20 games. That's that's not the point I'm trying to make. It's just when, you know, especially from an analytical perspective, do you get a really good grasp on a team uh, teams sort of level it's usually around the 25 to 30 game um, game mark somewhere around there one of the kind of traditional hockey media answers to that would always be like american thanksgiving yep, that too yeah which is 20 days from now so what's that another eight to ten games depending on the schedule so yeah we're, we're definitely itching close to that but still probably too early however we're starting to get a pretty solid sample I just want to point out I fixed the TV. You did. <laughs> wow. And you know what? That Those clickers, they give us a time. Started changing the one on the right. I thought you were going to change it to our <laughs> logo. I was getting a little anxious there. Nope. nope well done, good. quads. Thank you. You know what? Well done to both of you. I got to be honest. This was one of, I think, the best episodes we've had in a long time on this show. Favorite, I've had a lot of really good episodes. Just going to throw that out there. But this was by far one of the best I think we've ever had on this show. So kudos to you both. Uh, for putting on a great show. We're getting a little more comfortable with each other, getting a little more comfortable in our set, and we're going to look to keep it rolling just like the Vancouver Canucks will tomorrow night in Ottawa. But for now, we will wrap it up there. For my co-host, Harmon Dial, and our technical producer, Grady Sass, my name is Dave Guadrelli. Thank you so much for listening to the episode of the Canucks Conversation. Canucks Conversation with Harmon and Quads every weekday at 2 p.m. Be sure to check it out 
on the Canucks Army YouTube channel. And if you missed it, go check it out on your favorite podcast catcher app.